All right, good morning. We have a few we have a few announcements this morning. <laughs> oh, done. Okay. Good morning. Um, first of all, the Easter egg hunt is being postponed to the week after Easter. That's one announcement. Secondly, we uh, heard from our social worker at DCF, and he, I, some of you may have seen it in church chat, we have a request. One of his clients um, is in danger of being evicted from his apartment. He has a one-year-old son. He does work full-time, so, and he's just fallen behind a bit. So um, any donations uh, would be much appreciated if you can. If you write a check to the church for any special donation, there are extra envelopes in the chapel room and inside there's a line that says special offering so you could write covenant to care or soup kitchen or whatever and put the amount so that it makes it much easier for the cash counters and for the treasurer to get that money directly where you want it to go so all right okay. so thank you And speaking of cash counting, uh, it's time for the quarterly contribution statements to go out. Uh, I put a note in the church chat about if you want your uh, statement to come to you via email to let me know. In case you're wondering if you've let me know previously, if you haven't gotten it already, you haven't let me know because everybody who uh, gave me their email address for it has received their statements already. So see me after church if you want your statement to come via email. Good morning. Our confirmation class is um, doing a uh, fundraiser. Um, we're going to have a pasta dinner. So save the date, Friday night, April 29th from 5 to 7. We'll be serving a pasta dinner. And you can either make a cash donation or you can um, get one of the items off a list. Lynn Iardi is working on a flyer, so we'll have that out for you soon. But we wanted to make sure everybody saves the date. Thank you. There's no All right, and a couple other announcements. Um, you may have noticed the Bibles have been returned to the church pews. They're in the little boxes underneath the pew in front of you. Um, the white supplemental hymnals are uh, tucked underneath the pews, although we're not using it this week, but you can always tell by whether we have red or white on our hymn numbers. Uh, let's see, this Thursday at 7 is our Monday Thursday service, which is always, it's an amazing thing if you've never attended, I, I highly recommend it. Um, it's powerful, moving, and, and you really should come. Uh, Friday, we uh, have our Good Friday service, also at 7 o'clock. And on Sunday, we'll have our sunrise service at the Labyrinth at 6, and our regular service here at 10. You don't need to choose. You can come to both. <laughs> All right. So good morning. My name is John Mazze. And as a member of the Board of Deacons of our church, I'd like to welcome you to this morning's worship service. Now, please allow the lighting of the altar candles and the ringing of the bell to invite you into silent prayer and meditation as we prepare ourselves to worship our God. Thank you.
Please stand for the call to worship. Lord, help us to be your humble servants. Help us to seek to bless others instead of ourselves. Help us to look up to you. Help us to follow your selfless example. Please remain standing for the gathering hymn, All Glory, Lord, and Honor, number 155. ask you to meet us here today. Help us, Lord, to get a deeper appreciation for who you are. Lord, we thank you for your humility, for coming down from glory to be incarnated in this human form. Lord, we thank you for your example when you rode into Jerusalem on a donkey rather than coming in like a conquering king. Help us to feel your presence in this place on this Palm Sunday. And we read the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus came into this world so that we could be forgiven for our sins. Let us confess them now freely. All, Lord, we confess our sins right now. In particular, we confess that we have not been humble, that we've allowed pride to creep in that we've been caught up in self so much that we've forgotten that we are dust, and to dust shall we return. Help us, Lord, to lean on you, not counting on what we can do apart from you, but focusing on who we are in your master plan. God knows our hearts and our spirits. 
God sees our struggles and forgives our weaknesses. Know that it is in God's healing love that you live and move and have your being. Rejoice, for God is with you always. Please stand for the Gloria Patri. be seated for the hymn Hosanna, Loud Hosanna, which is found as an insert in your program. Mm -hmm. This time we're going to have our sharing of joys and concerns. Uh, I still only have one hearing aid, so please speak loudly and clearly and slowly. And uh, uh, John will pass out the mic. Yes, I'd like to thank everybody for all my prayers and healing the last few weeks, and uh, my surgery has gone extremely well, and uh, I'm on a good road to recovery. Thank you.
troops are men and women in the military and all of their families and prayers for peace and And I don't know if you can see it, but I'm wearing yellow and blue. I think I'll keep wearing yellow and blue until the war ends. So I'll keep washing the same shirt over and over again. <laughs> All right, Lord, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We ask you, Lord, to bless us all, Lord. Bless those who gave their joys and concerns and those who did not, Lord. Lord, right now, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for courage, Lord. Yes, Lord, for those who are going through crises, Lord. Yes, Lord, we ask you, Lord, to bless Barb's dad, Lord, and help him, Lord, with his congestive heart failure. Lord, we ask you to bless Courtney, Lord, with her exam on April 25th. Lord, we give thanks for George, Lord. Yes, Lord, for coming back and being so strong. And we ask you, Lord, to bless Jill, Lord, and the military and the people of Ukraine. And uh, at this time, I have a couple of quick announcements. First, uh, if there are any first time visitors, would you uh, please raise your hand? Uh, welcome, Minister Massaquoi. Uh, Minister Massaquoi is coming from my previous church, Friendship Baptist Church. He's coming to visit. Uh, let's give him a warm welcome. The mighty man of God. Also, you'll notice there are palms here. I'm going to be standing out in the, the foyer with the palms and handing them out at the end of the service. And you get to keep them. And um, there will be no prayer or Bible study this coming Wednesday because we'll be rehearsing from Monday, Thursday, which should be an interesting play sort of uh, presentation. So I hope to see you all there. And we're going to be doing the seven last words on Friday the seven last words of Christ on the Friday evening service. And um, hopefully, we well, uh, prayerfully, the following week, we'll get back to our six o'clock prayer and our seven o'clock Bible study. Uh, can I get an amen? amen? So at this time, we're going to have our invitation to generosity.
This morning's scripture lesson is from the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. This can be found on the back of your bulletin. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And may God add his blessing to our understanding of this, his holy word. Good morning. Good morning. You all look lovely today. Amen. Amen. Looking forward to uh, uh, Easter Sunday. 
uh, when uh, you're going to be dressed to the nines. <laughs> Giving honor to God, who is the head of my life, to all of you who came out to hear a word from the Lord today, let us pray. Lord, we ask you to bless this sermon, pour down your wisdom from heaven, remove everything that is in Daniel, and let your spirit shine through. Bless the ears that hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As we've just heard, the Old Testament book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9, reads, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Today, I'm going to preach on the sermon, He Came into Jerusalem Riding on a Donkey, with the subtitle, The Importance of Humility. While my sermon text is from the Old Testament, it refers to an event that happened in the New Testament. Now, how many of you know that the Old Testament and the New Testament are vitally connected? For those who need a refresher course, and we all need a refresher course from time to time, the New Testament is essentially about the works of Jesus Christ and the formation of the church. It starts with the four Gospels that portray Jesus' birth and ministry, and then goes on to the book of the Acts of the Apostles and a series of epistles or letters written to define church doctrine, then culminates with the book of Revelation, which speaks of Jesus' second coming and the last days. The Old Testament, on the other hand, starts with Genesis and the other four books of Moses, and then is followed by a number of historical books and books written by Israel's prophets. The last Old Testament book was written 400 years before Jesus' birth, and the Old Testament also includes the book of Proverbs and Psalms. Essentially, one can describe the Old Testament as being about God's relation to his chosen people, the Israelites, and the New Testament as God's relation to his chosen people, the individual believers in Christ. The fact that we walk around with Bibles that include the Old Testament as well as the New speaks to the connection between the two books. One of the main ways the two Testaments are connected is that Jesus frequently quotes the Old Testament. Jesus was a Jew, after all and that he sees himself as fulfilling Old Testament prophecies. In fact, it is reported that Jesus fulfilled 351 Old Testament prophecies, one of which being the prophecy we are focusing on today from the book of Zechariah. The New Testament verses that show the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy can be found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, these are called the Synoptic Gospels because they share much of the same material. In all three, the story they tell is of Jesus asking his disciples to fetch him a colt, also translated donkey, to ride into Jerusalem. He then comes riding on the donkey into Jerusalem to cheers from the crowds who lay palm branches in front of him, thus the name Palm Sunday for the Sunday before Easter. And while this is a triumphant spectacle, as the King of Kings comes to the city where the temple of God stood, I want to highlight the humility that Jesus exhibits here, coming as he did on a donkey. Now, donkeys are not usually associated with kings. In fact, donkeys are known to be very stubborn and they were portrayed in the Bible not as animals written by glorious conquerors, but as symbols of service, suffering, peace, and humility. To understand why Jesus would specifically request a donkey to ride into Jerusalem, we have to understand who Jesus was and his purpose for coming down to earth in his first incarnation. For while there will be a second incarnation, 
a second coming, if you will, at the end of history, a second coming where Jesus will indeed appear as a conquering king, one who will in fact be riding on a white horse instead of a donkey. In this incarnation, Jesus is coming as the Lamb of God. Jesus's main mission on earth was to be realized in Jerusalem with his death on a cross on Calvary, where he took on all sin and later triumphed over death with his resurrection three days later. Jesus did not go to the cross by accident. His mission on earth in his first coming 2,000 years ago was to take on all sin so that humanity could be forgiven for our sins and found guiltless before the judgment seat of God and thereby get into heaven. In order to do this, Jesus had to humble himself, coming down from glory, where he sat with God the Father and the Holy Spirit, to be born as a human being. Note that this verse, this birth itself was specifically humble. We are told that he was born in a manger, that he came into this world in a barn or a cave used for livestock, hardly a royal birth more like something you'd find in the TV show Green Acres, those of you who remember it. The Bible has a lot to say about the importance of humility. Matthew 18 and four reads, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 23 and 12 says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Proverbs 22 and 4 tells us that, quote, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. And 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 emphatically states, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And these are but a few of the verses the Bible speaks of regarding the importance of humility. Why is humility so important? For one thing, Jesus coming down from glory to be the Lamb of God who was slain for the sins of this world was the ultimate act of humility. For another, humility is vitally practical. Not only does it cure a host of psychological ills and make us better people, it is the virtue that allows us to be in right relation to God. As Andrew Murray so succinctly puts it in his classic quote, well, the name of the book is Humility, colon, The Journey Toward Holiness. He says, quote, humility is not so much a virtue along with others, but is the root of all, because it alone takes the right attitude before God and allows him as God to do all. And for me, humility is extremely personal, as it speaks to my heart and puts me in the right frame of mind like nothing else. So much so that I have been preaching and writing about humility for over 15 years now, culminating with the audiobook It's Not All About You, The Secret Joy of Practical Humility, as well as the Lenten devotionals you've been reading daily. Humility also causes me to do the dishes Sometimes. Can I get an amen, Christine? <laughs> She's got her mask on so we can't hear her. I define humility in three ways. First, humility is putting ourselves in proper perspective. That is not thinking too high, too low, or too often of ourselves. Second, humility is accepting those things in life that we do not like, but that we cannot change. And third, humility is being thankful for everything we do like about life. Given my definition, we can see why God stresses the importance of humility in the Bible. First off, putting ourselves in perspective means putting God in the center of our universe instead of ourselves. This reminds us of a lesson Copernicus taught us 400 years ago when he discovered that the earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around, 
proclaiming a message that screams, if the earth does not revolve around the, if the, if the sun does not revolve around the earth, the world does not revolve around us. You see, church, God is the sun around which our lives need to revolve. Putting ourselves or even humankind in the center of our universe is doomed to failure as we are all finite beings. That's why God needs to be the center of our lives for only God is eternal. With our lives revolving around God the Father and the Son, S-O-N, we can have joy and stability. Can I get another amen? amen? The second part of my definition of humility refers to acceptance. When we accept the things in life we find distasteful, we accept God's will for us. If we only accepted the things we like, we wouldn't be sacrificing anything. But accepting God's will for us, whether we like it or not, shows character and shows that we love God. Now note that I'm not saying we shouldn't try to change those aspects of our lives that are toxic and are within our power to change, just that we should accept those things that we cannot change, like the fact that I'll never be as cute as my granddaughter Miracle. <laughs> Here again, Jesus is the perfect example of humility. Jesus accepted his role despite the most objectionable circumstances imaginable. Did Jesus want to go to the cross? Clearly, this is not so. For he actually begged God to take the cup away from him in the Garden of Gethsemane, just before the temple guards came to take him away, leading to his judgment and eventual crucifixion. But even as Jesus asked the Father to take the cup from him, to not go to the cross unless it was absolutely necessary, he accepted God's will, saying, not my will, but thy will be done. The other day I had a particularly difficult morning. The devil was busy and seemed to be attacking me on every side. My son had left something he needed for school that I was trying to bring to him, only to find that his school was locked down due to a bomb threat. My dog chased my neighbor's son across the street and my stepson texted me that he was having problems and needed my help immediately. I had to accept that I was having a bad day, and I did so reminding myself that they are relatively rare these days, as this is a particularly blessed season in my life. For God has blessed me with two dream jobs, my job here as a pastor and my psychotherapy business, a lovely wife, a fine young stepson, my lovely granddaughter Miracle, and a birth son Sam, who I love dearly one who has yet to abandon me and go off to college. This brings me to my third and final part of my definition of humility, one that just so happens to be another virtue the Bible emphasizes over and over again, thanksgiving. We 21st century Americans have so much to be thankful for. Think of all the modern conveniences we enjoy today. We have our choice of restaurants bringing cuisine from all over the world. We have nice clothes to wear, nice houses to live in, not to mention the wonders of our smartphones and our technology. Yet we often fail to recognize all of our blessings. This is due in part because we often are in a too big a hurry to really enjoy the present moment. So instead of appreciating all of the advantages we've been given, we suffer from impatience, focusing on whatever isn't going perfectly as if we expect heaven on earth. Take the example of texting. I was thrilled when I discovered my phone could offer me a choice of words before I finished typing them in. At first that is. <laughs> Soon, I got used to the convenience, and then instead of being grateful for it, I was perturbed every time the phone failed to correctly guess the word I had started typing in. Talk about being spoiled. 
Can anyone relate? You see, church, the key to happiness is being thankful for what you have instead of focusing on what you're missing. That is to look at your glass as half full rather than half empty. To thank God for all the blessings instead of complaining about the ones you haven't got. To be humbly grateful rather than grumbly hateful. No, life in the USA in 2022 is not perfect. But while we don't live in poverty, as some of our brothers and sisters do, especially in poor countries, and while we live in a democracy and aren't suffering like our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, we still have issues. In particular, we have plenty of stress in our lives. Stress that keeps us from focusing on the blessings we enjoy in the present moment. Stress that comes from living in a world where all of us seem to be in a rush. When I was young, my dad went to work and my mom stayed home and raised the kids. Nowadays, that is impossible for all but a very few of us. So I'm not saying we have it easy, but I am saying that compared to much of the world, we have it good. The key is your perspective. Here is where humility comes in. Self-help guru Tony Robbins tells the story of two men he met during his seminars. One made $2 million and thought he was a failure because he wasn't making $5 million. The other said, every day that I'm above ground is a good day. Who do you think was happier? But ultimately, the most important thing we Christians have to be thankful for is Jesus Christ and what he did for us when he came down from glory to be born in a major and then go to the cross for us. Today, as we celebrate his humble entry into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, let us reflect on his humility and do our best to imitate it. For when we are humble, we are at peace with the world. We accept our role as part of God's creation, a significant part, but still just one part of an immense universe so large we can't even begin to fathom it. We accept God's will for us, including the bitter as well as the sweet, and we are thankful for all of God's blessings. My brothers, my sisters, as we go through this Holy Week, let us remind ourselves to be humbly grateful and not grumbly hateful. Can I get my final amen, church? Amen. Right now, there might be one who does not know Christ or one who feels they have backslidden and want to reestablish their relationship with God. Whether that's someone here in the sanctuary or someone watching the service, I want you to know that Jesus is waiting, that God loves you, if you feel called to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, just repeat after me. Lord, I am a sinner in need of salvation. I turn my life over to you. I believe you are the Son of God and that you died on a cross for my sins and that you were raised again on the third day, conquering death and hell. If that was you when you're here in the sanctuary, I ask you to speak with me after service. Finally, if there's anyone here who does not have a church home and wants to join this body of believers, if that's you, I ask you to speak with one of the deacons after church service is over. God bless you all. At this time, we're going to have our closing hymn. Uh, please stand. Let the whole creation cry, number 69. Yeah.
Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for giving us a mind made up to worship you. And Lord, as we leave this place, but not from your presence, help us, Lord, to find our homes in order. Bless us in our homes and in our workplaces. Give us traveling mercies. Help us, Lord, to show the world what Christians really are so that more souls may come to Christ and be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.